Okay, so let's see what this says. Optimization, the best way. We're going to be searching for the best way to do something. Does this always mean we're looking for a highest point? No. No. When might, give me one potential real life example where finding the lowest point would lead to the best way of doing something. X squared? Not a specific function. Oh. Give me a situation where you might in real life be looking for a smallest number and that would lead you to the best way of doing something. Uh, the smallest amount of material to do something for the most amount of money. Yeah, like minimizing cost, right? That might be the what you're trying to optimize. Optimize does not necessarily mean the highest point. It could be it's some extreme in there. It's some extreme in there. Okay, so absolute maximum. Let's look at some new notation. I think I might have said this a little bit, but here's here's something that's important that you understand what it means. Hold on a sec. For all. And this right here means contained in. For all its value, it's contained in the domain. Contained in the domain, exactly. Mathematicians have certain phrases and certain words that are repeated over and over and over and over again. So instead of writing those same phrases over and over and over again, what do they do? Make symbols. Make symbols, exactly. And they've already done that. For example, do we write, when we write square root, do we write the two there? Nope. No. It's commonly agree that when nothing is there, what is there? Two. Right? So this happens all the time. Mathematicians love efficiency and you know these are small things, but there are many words when you start dealing with certain fields of math, you're gonna have to write for all many times. Anybody know what a backwards E means? That means there exists. There exists. And then an exclamation point means unique. So for example, if you do this, what does that mean? There exists a unique X. Anybody know what the bar means? Such that. So you can write whole sentences without any words, really. And this is, this is important because as you take more math, you will take fields of math where you're going to have to write things like this all the time. And it, it's nice to be able to use this math. So this is what the notation means. You will see it in your book, and I will use it. So please make sure you understand it. That's the absolute max. The absolute max, and this is the max. local max, exactly. That's the local max. Because for a neighborhood, and this seems like a pretty imprecise word, but neighborhood is a really commonly used word. There is an interval. What is that interval? Oh, it's right here. Can you make it a little bigger? Probably. But the idea is you can have some interval to the left and to the right. What about this? What about the function y equals x cubed? What does that look like? What shape does that take? Uh, you had to describe it? A little bit of a thing? Yeah. Kind of goes like this, right? Looks like that, right? Not very well done, but it's like that. What is this right here? That's the origin, okay? Is that a local min? Yes. Is there a neighborhood you can place around 0, 0, such that is the highest point in that neighborhood? Yes. Really? No. Every point well, to the left, right. yeah. every point to the left is below it, right? And every point to the right is above, above it. I, I'll ask again, is that a local min? No. Is that a local max? No. Is it an absolute min? Absolute no. max? No. This is an interesting point. The derivative there is zero, actually. But is it a local min or max? No. Always remember that. Always remember that just because the derivative is zero doesn't mean you're always at a min or a max. There's an example. Always, always remember that. You'll need to remember ex uh, exceptions to the rule. OK. so. How does the definition change if I just change it to minimum, like absolute mi max min? So if this right here is the definition for a maximum, this right here is the definition for a maximum. What's the only thing that changes inside the definition if I change it to minimum? Less than. Yeah, less than, right. So if I change it to minimum, the only thing that changes is the inequality. That's the only thing that changes right there. Only thing that changes is the inequality. So I'll change this right here right here like that like that you got that cool okay again why are we looking at these places why are we looking at local minimums why are we looking at absolute max? why are we looking at these places why are they interesting why why is optimization important because it has applications in life yeah there's lots of places where this could be applicable lots of direct applications very very direct applications can you make things really inefficiently yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can. There's lots of different ways. Is there usually a way to uh, do something most efficiently? Yeah. yeah, sometimes. Is there sometimes more than one way? Yeah. Yeah, and how does that express itself in terms of these graphs? Let's say I gave you this right here. Could you have a function like this? Yeah, sure. Why not? What can you say about these two points? What are they? 
Same. Same output value, right? What are they? They're both maxes. Both. What kinds of maxes? Absolute. Absolute maxes. Can you have more than one? Yes. yes. What are they also, in addition to being absolute maxes, what else are they? They're both local. So all absolute maxes so far that you've seen are also local maxes. Kind of makes sense there. But usually it trumps the fact that it's a local, that it's the absolute. So can you have more than one? Yes. Please remember that as well. And if you don't have the endpoints, this is what you could do. Let's say it doesn't include that, right? Instead of going to that point, what could I do? You could spike up, right? Well, it's continuous everywhere on that interval, but does that have a max? No. no. But if it has to get to, look, if it has to get to be somewhere on an x value, what does it mean for the y value? The y value has to stop somewhere, right? If you get somewhere, you're there. Deep sentence, right? <laughs> if you get to 2, if the function is evaluated at 2 on the x value, me, what does that mean? It means that it goes to, two, it, it hits 2 on the, for an x value, which means it has to have an output at 2, right? And if it has an output, it has a value there, which means it would probably be the max if it's going really far up, right? Yeah. But, but if it's not, it could just keep on spiking up. So here, ready? It goes, woo, and it stops on B. So does this have to have a max and a min? Absolutely. OK, that's nice. So anything that spikes to infinity. Thank you. If F has a local minimum or maximum at C, and the derivative exists, then the derivative has to be? Zero. Zero. Let's say it wasn't zero. If you're at a point and the derivative isn't zero, let's say it's like this. Can you create a neighborhood around it such that it's always the biggest or the smallest? No. If the derivative isn't zero, oh, it no. means it's increasing or decreasing at that point, right? Meaning, if I do this neighborhood around it, one side is going to be bigger and one side is going to be smaller. The only way is what this is saying. The only way, if it is a minimum or maximum and it has a derivative there, the derivative has to be zero. Like yes. Is a number c in the domain of f such that either the derivative is 0 or the derivative doesn't exist at c? This is hugely important. Big, massive mistakes are made when students go looking for critical numbers, and they only find where, which one? f prime is, is, is 0, yeah. right? You need to find both, OK? Where? You will look for critical numbers many times in this class. You must find where the derivative is 0 or does not, does not exist. This is hugely important. This is absolutely something they will try to trip you up with on the AP test. They could, absolutely. So just remember this. You don't know where you're going to be doing these at the moment. Well, you, you strongly suspect you'll be using them in optimization problems. But please, you're looking for it when the derivative is 0 or it does not exist. Does everybody see that right there? And what's that function exception? What's that one I told you so far? X cubed. <laughs> Think, these are good things to remember because you're going to have multiple choice questions where they're going to be like, they're going to give you something, is, is one true, is two true, is one and two true, is one and three true, are not. You have to do it in the, the exception things like, for example, absolute value here, that's a continuous function, right? Is the derivative continuous? No. No, because it instantaneously goes from negative to positive, right? So, for example, I could ask you, is it possible for continuous function for its derivative not to be continuous? And you go, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So that's what a critical number is. What are we going to do with them? Well, the closed interval method. To find the absolute max and min values of a continuous function on a closed interval. You see closed interval there? Important. Find the values of f at the critical numbers of f in the open interval. So first of all, you find the critical numbers. You then find the values at those critical numbers, and you find the values at the endpoints, right? So for example, why do you have to do the endpoints? Well, let's say your domain is only restricted to a certain part of the function. So for example, let's say the function does this. And let's say the interval you're looking at is from here all the way to here, right? So if you found the critical if you found the critical points, the derivative looks like it's 0 there and it looks like it's 0 right there, right? On this interval, it still looks like this is the max on that interval. Do you agree? Is, that, is this relative minimum, does that look like the minimum value on that interval? No, it, all, it looks like the minimum value is right there at the end point of the interval. So please remember this. Always check where the deriv critical numbers are also where the derivative is equal to 0. And when you're looking for highest and lowest points on a closed interval, always also check the end points. 
It's a really easy way to do a ton of work and then not get the answer point. Answer points are generally one point on the free response questions at a nine. And can that make a big depth deal on your test score? Yeah. If you consistently get the answer points wrong, big deal. Big deal. And then look, the largest value from one and two is the max. The smallest is the min. Let f be a function that satisfies the following hypotheses. You have to really, really know these cold. It's continuous on the closed interval. It's continuous on the closed interval. It's differentiable on the open. So for example, if this was an absolute value function and it included a little like bend, can we apply the mean value theorem? No, because the, it's not differentiable on the point of an absolute value function, OK? So first thing, it's continuous on the closed, it's CC, continuous on the closed. It is differentiable on the open. Differentiable on the open. I'm trying to come up with new things that might help you. This is the important part. Then there is a number c somewhere in the open interval. You see how that's the open interval? Such that f prime of c is equal to this. What does that look like right here? This should look like something familiar. What is this? Slope. Between what and what? B and a. Between, b and a are numbers between two points. Which yeah. two points? The function of b and the function of a. f of a and f of b. Yeah, so between the points a, f of a, and what? b, f of b. Exactly. This says if the function is continuous on the closed and differentiable on the open, there's some c value in between a and b such that the derivative there is equal to the, essentially, the slope between the endpoints. The slope between the endpoints. What does this represent? What does that look like right there? It looks like slope point slope form. It actually is. It totally is. Graphically, what does this look like? Graphically, it looks like this. Let's say you had some function that went from a f of a to b comma f of b. Great. And what does the fun for the mean value theorem to apply? What needs to be true? Differentiable on the okay. open, continuous on the. Close. Judging by this picture, look. Does it look like it's continuous on the open? Mm -hmm. Sorry, continuous on the closed and differentiable on the open. Yep. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. So what this says is somewhere between a and b. So what does that mean? Somewhere between a and b. So let's let's do a number line right here. Here's a and here's b right there. There's a c somewhere in between there, such that the derivative at c is equal to the slope between these two points. In order to see this, let's just draw the line between the two points. Watch. Look, look. Oh, that didn't work. That's still not working. Fine. You really don't want to be cranky? Fine, fine, fine. Let's do a wider one. Let's do that one. And we're doing a line. Good. Ready? Ready? So there. Ah, oh, why? Ah, oh, come on. OK, so that, that, pretend that's the line connecting a f of a and b f of b, right? You want to find the c values such that c is between a and b, and the derivative at c, the derivative at c is equal to that rate of change. How many c values do you see that would fit that? A couple. There's at least two. It really looks like there's at least two. So what do you do to see that? Take that line and slide it directly up and down. Don't change the slope of the line. Slide it directly. Up and I don't think I can, I can't see it now. It looks like there's one right here, and it looks like there's one right there. So the first thing you've noticed is how many different c values can there be, theoretically? Infinite. There could be infinite, right? You infinite could design. Awesome. Yeah, remember, there's zero answers to a question, there's one answer to a question, or there's all of them, right? So can there be more than one? Yeah. Absolutely, there can be one and one, but this is really important. It must be continuous on the closed and differentiable on the oh, oh. open. This is hugely important. This is hugely important. Does this make sense so far, everybody? OK, let's get to an actual question where you could. With position functions s equals f of t, then the average velocity between t a and t b is, the average velocity is the slope between the two points. Thus, the mean value theorem tells us that at some time c between a and b, the instantaneous velocity equals the average velocity. Yeah. Some point. If I'm going, if I, if, I, if I take a trip and the average speed, we'll talk about speed, it's fine. The average speed is 50 miles an hour. 
is it possible for me never to have gone 50 miles an hour? No. No. Why? Because you can't teleport. Because <laughs> you can't. Thank you. Because you can't. We already talked about this, right? The trampoline problem. Is there any way for you to jump over the speed of 50 miles an hour? No. Not so far as we know, right? In order for you to average 50, you have to, let's say, can't go 50. Well, then you'd have to stay below it. But if you stay below 50 miles an hour, your average speed will never be 50, right? And if, you're, if you go above it, oh, you've just crossed it, right? So there, logically, that should make sense. You can't teleport yet. I've, yet. I like that. Uh, you like that? No. Or you could do how we talked about. What's the first thing someone should do? Do what? What should I do first? Set up your equation. Well, hold on. What? Yeah. So find f of negative 1, which is negative 1 cubed, which is negative, negative one. 1. So you have the point negative 1, negative 1. And then you need f of 2, which is 2 cubed which is 8, so you have the point 2, comma 8, right? So the slope is going to be 8 minus, yeah, I like how you said 8 minus negative 1, that was good, over, let me make sure I'm recording here, yep, over 2 minus negative 1, and you end up with 9 over, which is 3. And that theoretically should make sense. This thing is always increasing, so if you take the slope between any two points, it should be positive. The derivative is 3x squared. It's always increasing, so it should be positive. OK, so you're trying to find the c value between negative 1 and 2 such that the derivative is 3. And since this is continuous on the closed and differentiable on the open, there should be at least 1. In this case, there is only 1 because it's a strictly increasing. Well, no. Yeah, it's always going to be 1. OK, so we do f prime of x, and we end up with what? 3x squared. 3x squared. So we want to know when 3x squared is equal to? 3x squared is equal to? Three equals equal to one, so x is equal to one plus or minus. Oh wait, did I just uh, plus or minus one? Right. Now we have to be careful here, right? I specifically asked find the c that that satisfies the mean value. And let's go back here. There exists a c in the open interval, open interval. So one of these points is on the interval, so we're not. You, that can't be the c value. So what c value are we talking about? One. Negative one is on the boundary of the interval. You, there has to be one inside. The mean value talks about one inside. Was it just random luck that I picked one that actually happened to be? Yeah, that's actually weird, OK? I hate it when that happens. It's my subconscious. I'm like, ah, show them the exceptions first. No. CC and what? DO. Yeah. A lot of things you could have said. That's true, but CC and DO. Closed. Continuous. Continuous closed and differentiable open. That's really important. Yes, and that was a terrible question to ask my class, apparently. <laughs> what four letter <laughs> word should you remember? Hey, come on, I'm innocent and naive. <laughs> and we're pausing. Decreasing. So, could you find me where the function is increasing and where it is decreasing? That function right there? Yes. Mm -hmm. What's the only annoying thing about finding where that function is increasing and decreasing? What do you have to do first? You have to take the derivative. And find out where the derivative is equal to? Zero. zero. So and if we did this out, f prime of zero. Well, no, I don't, f prime is f prime of x is equal to 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 24x plus what? Zero. Yeah. Correct. Here, yes. 12x. Squared. Oh, that really didn't work. So we want to figure out where that is equal to. Zero. zero. So we want to set this equal to zero. And luckily. You, well, you can take out a 12, and you can take out a what? X. That's the saving grace here, because you really want to have to factor cubics. No. Take out 12x, and then you have to use, well, or you just have to be really, really clever, and we don't want that to happen. Minus x plus what? 12. Oh, minus two. what? Minus 2. And does this nicely factor? Yeah. And if, nicely, though, are there any places where the derivative doesn't exist? Yeah. Are there no, any places? No. No, no, no there, it exists everywhere. So this is x minus 2 times x plus 1. So we know that the derivative is equal to 0 at what? Negative 1 and? Negative 1, 0, zero and two. what? 2. So you know it equals 0 here. So f prime of x is equal to 0 on these places, right? Are there any other places where the derivative equals 0? No. No. So everywhere else has to be all positive or all negative in these intervals. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You plug in take values. A point in, between those. in between. So you take some points here, exactly. So maybe check, you know, for here, I would, pl I would plug in huge number, <laughs> right? For here, I would plug in 1. I don't know, negative a half and? Huge number. Negative huge number, right? You can choose it, make it as small as you want. And an easy way to do this, 
just so you don't get totally messed up, here's your derivative factored out, correct? 12x, x minus 2, and x plus 1, and the product. So if x is, let's say, this is the x value. So the x value, like this. If the x value is, I don't know, negative a lot. What's 12 times negative a lot? It's negative. And then this one's going to be negative. And this one's going to be negative. multiply them all together. You're going to get negative. So therefore, we know that this is negative. Negative, right? Then let's plug in negative a half. What's the first one become? Negative. Negative. Negative and positive. positive. So it ends up being positive. 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 Plug in one. You get positive. Negative, negative and positive. So it turns out to be negative. negative. Woohoo! Yeah. What's going on with that table? I don't really. This multiplied together is the derivative, right? Right. We're trying to figure out is the derivative positive or negative, right? So we're finding out if each piece is positive or negative, and then multiplying together each piece. This is just an, a really straightforward way. It breaks down the problem into is 12 times negative 1 positive or negative? And you want to break things down like that, especially since does it take much effort to break this down? No. No. You're going to get this all the time. You're going to have factored it because you're looking for zeros. Your key to finding zeros is usually factoring. So you find each one, you plug, oh, it's negative. So let's make that purple. purple. And then we plug in a huge one, right? Well, that's going to be positive, positive, and positive. So the last one is positive. I don't, yeah, I should have done that. I just like doing that because it clarifies the marks a little bit. So what does that mean? Well, can we now say conclusively where the, where the oh, negative, oh, it's blue, thank you. Thank you. I needed my color help there. So can we find out where is this function increasing if we ask that? Yes. yes. Yeah, it's increasing where? From negative 1 to 0. And yeah, hold on. But it's not, but, but not at those values. That's really important. It's increasing from really, really close to negative 1, but not including negative 1, all the way to 0, but not including 0. And where? 2. Well, not too really, really no, close to two, two. Not including two. Yeah, and do you ever, is any, are any of those closed? No. This is really important. You can't get sloppy or none of those are closed. Can you, can you close on infinity? No. no. Why? Because infinity, they keep going. You can't get there. It doesn't end. By definition, you should not be able to close the deal on infinity, right? It's, it's not a number. It's an idea. It's really important because you, it, you will not get the answer for it if you close these off. It's really important. So we can find that. that that's great. Could you find where it's decreasing? Sure. Absolutely. It's the same, same thing. Is it taking C as an inter uh, interval points or just? It could be, C could be at different values, yes. Okay. So in this case, C just represents somewhere in the some interval. Number. Yes, some number, yes. So in this case, the derivative changes from negative to positive, positive to negative, and negative to positive. positive. So can someone tell me what happens right here? The function's going down and then up. So what happens at? OK, well, the function does, but the derivative function does. That's correct. But the original function, can someone tell me what's going on? It's going down, and then it's going up. So has a local what? Local min. It has a local min. It's going down and then up. What's going on right here? It's going up and then down. So local what? Max. Max. And then what's going on right here? Local min. On the test, you have to say that out. You can't use number lines like this as full justification. You'd have to say, because the derivative changes from negative to positive, and we also know the derivative exists, so that helps. That helps too. So we have a local min, a local max, and a local min. They could be maxes, but they could be absolute, but we don't know that yet. OK, that's the first derivative test. Um, the last thing we need to talk about before we're done here is the second derivative test, which tests for concavity. Wait, concavity test. Nope, not necessarily. We haven't talked about concavity yet. Concavity, you actually have an idea of what concavity is, and we're going to define it for you. This is important. We did talk about it. We touched on it a little bit. This would be concave up. This would be concave down. Theoretically, this is a, well, no, this is a local min, right? Yes. Agree with that? Yeah, that's nice. 
and this is a local max. What's the concavity at every single local max? Concave. It has to be concave. Think about it in your head. Is there any way for it to be a local max and for it to be concave up? The strict definition of concavity is if the tangent line is below, it has to be concave up. Tangent line below means concave up. This means tangent line is exactly. Now, what's really interesting about my high school life is that I kind of remember a few things clearly. One of them is this. S frowny face, negative. Happy face, positive. Ready? Frowny face, negative. negative. Happy face, positive. This if the second, if this, this is what goes on in my head. If the second derivative is negative, you have a frowny face, so it's concave down. down. If the second derivative is positive, you have a happy face, so it's positive. concave up. Ready? Frowny face, concave down. Happy face, concave up. Positive second derivative means concave up. Negative second derivative means frowny face, so it's concave down. That and like the law of cosines would be if they stripped like everything away from my personality in high school, it would probably be c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine c. Yeah, that's right. I was cool. Test match. Hope so. <laughs> What's the derivative of this, Maddie? Uh, yeah, what can we factor out of each of these? 12. 12 times 3x squared minus 2x minus 2. two. Okay, so we're interested. What is the second derivative at these three values, right? What were they? Negative 1, 0, and 2. Negative 1, 0, and 2. So what's f of negative 1 here? 12 times 3 plus 2 minus 2. Is that positive or negative? Well, let's just figure that that's going to be 36, which is greater than 0. That's all we're really, we, we don't care what it equals, but is it positive or negative? Yeah. What about f of, f double prime of 0? 12 times 0 minus 0 minus 2 is going to be? Negative. Which is? less than 0. And f double prime of 2 is 12 times 3 times 4 minus 8 minus 2. It's going to be 12, so it's going to be 24. Is that correct? Right? Yeah. Thank you. And is that positive or negative? Ah, so this is positive, so it means it's concave what? Up. This is concave down. And this means it's concave up, right? So if this is concave up, it means this has should be a min, right? This should be a max, and this should be a min. Is that what we got up here? Let's say, yeah, min, max, and min. So does it agree? Yes. In this case, is it pretty much the same amount of work to do either the second or the first? Yeah. The only, thing I, the only thing different here is that like making that chart may take a little bit longer than doing this, right? It might take a little longer. So it's up to you. You can use either one. Either one says the same thing. It'll tell you if it's a min or a max, conclusively tell you if it's a min or max. You still have to find those points that you want to test that by. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but, but we could skip, for example, if I just asked you to prove that they're mins or maxes, you could find that derivative, not factor it, and then go straight to the second derivative and not even do this chart, right? Go straight to the second derivative test. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Sometimes finding that second derivative is going to be terrible. <laughs> right? It's going to be awful, clean. right? So you have to use your judgment. Which one are you going to use? They both tell you the same thing, but they also, if you're putting together a graph, they tell you different things. They, one tells you about concavity and mins or maxes. One doesn't tell you, one just tells you increasing or decreasing. So are we going to piece together what functions look like based on these things? Absolutely. Your homework tonight will be in the